Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. Katie, alcoholic. I, uh... I, like Charlie, have my timer here. I told Leah, he goes, I'll give you the cut sign. I go, you won't have to. Watching it right here. Um, Oh, my gosh. Being on Sunday, where is Amy here yet? There you are, girl. Well, I always admire. You can do Sunday and pull it off well. I'm like, when is it my time? Uh, The... uh, uh, I've been sober since October the 28th of 1984, and for that I am truly grateful. I uh, I do always give Charlie a little grief. You know, he, I don't know if you noticed, but I stood up for 38, and he stood up for 37. And uh, <laughs> that always feels good. I, you know, some people go, all oh, the time in my relationship doesn't matter. I'm like, well, it does in mine, so good for you. <laughs> It's, uh, and, and I always, we always used to say I had a year more than him, and then one day he realized it's only five and a half months more than he does. And, uh, so I said, okay, well then, in, you know, when you're having trouble in about five and a half months, it'll make more sense to you. So just hang in there and, and you'll get, you'll get it. Uh, it is really, truly a privilege to be here. This is a big deal. This particular conference was supposed to be here, was meant to be here. And, and it grew like crazy. That's how you can always tell when a conference is really supposed to be in God's hands. And, and Glenn and Jane, you know, of course the committee, don't get me wrong, but I've watched them as tapers around the country. It's pretty remarkable to see what they do. And I'm a huge fan for you younger generation and technology. Be very careful that if we don't have the tapers, we don't have this. We don't have the microphone that's got the great sound. We don't have the hard CD. We don't have the drive. We don't have those things if we don't support them. And that is so, so important because they truly are our historians, right? And without them, and I get worried because sometimes we've been to conferences where the guy goes, uh, oh, I got a buddy who's in IT. Oh, oh, great. Everybody's in IT under the age of 30, you know. Uh, and uh, the mic sounds terrible. The speakers aren't good. There's, the room is too big. And, and Lee is just good at this. I just love Lee. And, and Glenn was spectacular with it, too. So, um, and all the speakers, golly, what a great lineup. It's always an honor to be in this particular lineup. And I got to tell you, uh, uh, Ralph, you know, the white boys, I was supposed to be in that family. I was supposed to be Ruby White. They needed one girl in those five boys. And I always told uh, Ralph, I said, Ralph, I, I am your sister. I'm your sister from another mister. And then, but what's different, what's really wild is his girlfriend and I are cut from the identical cloth. We passed each other in the hall, and that energy and that vibe, we started talking, and, and you know how women are. We go deep fast. And the next thing you know... I'm looking at her going, it's exactly what happened with Charlie. He and Ralph are exactly alike. You know, right down that, and it's like, well, let me tell you how I got him fixed. Right there. That's that's how that deal worked. And she, I have a feeling she's going to do it. So get ready, Ralph. Uh, my uh, my husband, you know, I love him with all my heart, and uh, you guys got to witness something that we just heard, you know, five days ago. Uh, and so I hope I make it through this talk without uh, getting too emotional because you know the truth of the matter is is I got plenty of time to get emotional but I just just want to kind of get the deal started so just hang in there with me and um, but I got to tell you our life is is unbelievable and uh, Charlie was my best friend one of the things that I can tell you is he he's noticed this my husband Joe I, I've been widowed once uh, I was married 20 years my husband Joe had a brain tumor and a lot of people that aren't in AA just assume he died of the brain tumor but if you're in Alcoholics Anonymous or you know me really well he ended up relapsing he had a brain tumor I took care of him for six years and he ended up uh, relapsing at 23 and a half years sober and went back out and he was out for 18 months and then died of a heroin overdose and uh, you know you just don't lob that out to somebody when you tell them you're a widow and you know he had a brain tumor they just immediately go to that so I'm totally fine with that uh, but I told Charlie I said you know God must think I'm really strong 
Because all I want to do is grow old with someone. That's always been me. I'm not the girl that dates. I don't even know how to date. And uh, I just love a man, and, and we make a commitment. i got two deal breakers. You, you hit me or screw around on me, and you're done. And uh, done. I'm talking toast the next day, toast. And, uh, yeah, I don't put up with any of that stuff. I'm just not that girl. Some people are. I'm, I admire you. I Kind of. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not the not the hitting part, but the infidelity. I don't know how you endure that. I, I can't handle that. But um, I love Charlie with all my heart, and uh, I just cannot believe I'm going to be alone without him. But it is what it is. And uh, you may or may not see me, and I'm not going to talk about that, okay? Just FYI. Well, there you go. It didn't last long at all, did I, Bob? <laughs> yep, didn't put it very much to the back, did I? Bob's up here trying to kind of coach me how to put that emotion back there. Uh, but our life is spectacular. We do everything together. And I like to be married to that guy. Now, not every guy digs that, but I dig it. And I like, we, we shoot shotguns competitively together. We speak together. Uh, we were both self-employed so we could hang out at the house as long as we wanted to together. And it worked really, really well. And Charlie said, you know, Katie, I never knew that I could have a relationship where I want to spend all my time with my significant other. And I, I love that we have that. Uh, you know, I, I've always been, Charlie said, you're the kind of person that people just come up and tell you anything. And I said, oh, buddy, it's been all like that all my life, and we're in the airport. And we landed in that POS airport in Charlotte. Oh, my God. No tram. No tram. And, oh, by the way, they're going to tell you every, you know, 20 steps how many more minutes till you're going to miss your flight. You know what I mean? And and I'm like, I have this fancy app, and I told Charlie, I said, honey, wow, it's like 23 minutes, and it's a tight connection anyway. And uh, I said, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to haul ass, and then when I get there, I'm going to fake a heart attack. So you <laughs> come as quick as you can, but I'll be on the ground. Don't panic when you see me. So, And I swear to God. I was going to go, oh, oh, wow, go down to one knee, kind of lay on my side. And, you know, we'll, we'll wait till Charlie can make it because he gets winded really fast. So we realized, oh, my God, I stopped the woman. I said, is there a tram? And she's like, no, ma'am. I'm like, well, send it up the flagpole, okay? You guys need to get a tram in this place because we're at C and we got to get to E36. And so I told Charlie, I said, oh, my God, I started walking fast. And we looked to our left at the women's bathroom and there's a an empty wheelchair where somebody has clearly gone in the bathroom. <laughs> and I don't care. I really don't care. I had a brief moment of shame, and then I went, sit down. And he goes, you want me to take your bag? So I go, I'm pushing him. I go, not till we get farther away. I just want to look like we're in the stream of, stream of life, you know? And, uh, and that god dang airport goes uphill. Yeah, you, you may not have noticed that unless you're pushing a 250-pound man in a POS wheelchair. I mean, those things are not like the real deal. And I mean, and, and I had looked at the weather, and the weather said it was going to be snowing. So I've got my flannel shirt on. I've got my parka on. Well, that was not on Friday. Friday, it was 51 degrees. And I mean, I kid you not, this is me. Charlie's trying to talk to me. I go, I can't, I can't talk right now. I can't, just get, and I'm an athlete, been a fitness professional all my life. I mean, oh, my God, by the time we got to the, the gate, they were boarding. And I'm like, I have to go in the women's bathroom. I strip all my shirt off, everything. I'm standing there in my sports bra. I'm like, I am burning up. I mean, I had a parka on, you know. It wasn't like I could stop and hand it to him. And I decided since my sports bra was the same color as my flannel shirt, I would just tie it up. So I just tied a knot in it. So I got a lot of flesh showing. Let's just put it that way. And I didn't care because I'm sweating like a horse. And... I come outside, and, and uh, they said, you know, start to board. Well, you got to go outside to board because you're getting on a plane about this big, you know. And I thought, oh, boy. So I'm, I get out there, and I'm standing in line, and this guy's standing in front of me, and he turns, he looks at me, he goes. And I thought, dude, 
man, I am so hot. I said, oh, forgive the outfit. I just got to put my, had to push my husband in a wheelchair. I said, unfortunately, he's got liver cancer. And the guy's, he's probably about 40. And he goes, drinking. <laughs> now, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? I looked at him. I said, no, heroin. It's from hep C. And he goes, oh, I had a heroin problem. I thought, yeah, of course you did. <laughs> of course you did, because you're another person in the stream of life that had I said nothing to, nothing would have happened. And I said, really? And I said, well, we're actually coming to a big conference, and the next thing you know, we're talking, and, and then Charlie comes out, and, and uh, we're getting on the plane, and you, he said, well, I've tried to stay sober, and blah, 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 because it goes right to it, you know what I mean? I say we're, we're involved in recovery. And then we're getting ready to sit down, and sure enough, he sits. He has to sit in the seat right next to us. I said, dude, do you see the undeniable hand of God here at work? You're in more trouble than you think you are. <laughs> so. That's the minute with Katie. And then Charlie, I tap, tap you in, Charlie. It's all you now. And he, you know, first step and the whole nine yards and the guy took our number and, you know, we, we, we said we know a ton of people here. But, you know, when the book says that we carry a vision of God's will into all our activities, that's not just being nice. That's figuring out. I believe, and this is me. I mean, some people go, whoa, she's a little over the top. So was Mark Houston. <laughs> first time I ever met him, I thought, oh, dude, take it down a few notches. I've entered the world of the spirit. Like, well, I don't even know what that means, okay? And uh, But I believe that God has orchestrated every moment of my life. And if I stay awake and aware, then I see the people I need to briefly speak to or they need to speak to me. I don't know which way it's going. Somebody at the gas pump, look up. Maybe they just need a smile, maybe something gentle. But when I'm in the bondage of self, I can't see any of that. And I like to look at my life as a parade. It really is. I mean, I just am waving and smiling. And everybody, you know, and people go by, they go. <laughs> it's like, oh, and you know that uh, I, I got, I got the younger generation makes my inventory every night. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the walk by with a cell phone. We were at an event where this, uh, this kid gets on the elevator with us. It's not an AA event. Well, as a matter of fact, we were at Mayo in Florida. Never looked up. Never said a word. I said, good morning. Oh, oh, oh. You know, back on his phone. Got off his phone, never said a word. And I thought, wow, he has no idea how that's shutting him off from the sunlight of the spirit. Could, probably a good person, good kid, but you know what I mean? Okay, I got to get in this step. I'd much rather visit with y'all. But uh, uh, I'm a little bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose. Charlie likes to always say that about me, and I, I am. I, I'll tell you I am. When I get on fire, I get on fire, and I, I, I would much rather sit up here and just tell you guys some funny stories, but I also like to say I'm, I'm, I am not the power. I'm the vessel to help you get connected to the power. I'm not the sponsor that's going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you both sides of it, and then you get to decide what you do because I don't want to rob you of the experience you're going to have, be it good or bad, right? I mean, I, I think you're dating a loser, but... Have at it, you know. That's it's not my job. Now I certainly wouldn't say that, but I'd say, wow, you know, you got to look at your your sex inventory and what is your saying and sound ideal for yourself. You know, or this guy seems seems to be pretty uh pretty dicey, you know. And but you know, when somebody says, well, I'm going to break up, we know that means ten more times, right? I have never seen a breakup in Alcoholics Anonymous once. And if you're going to tell me that you've had it, I don't believe you. Okay, so I've been around a while. Uh, so I like to say I'm the vessel to help you get connected to the power. I love what it says in the 12 and 12. There's a direct link among self-examination, meditation, and prayer. Taken separately, they can bring much relief. So ask yourself, Mark used to say, turn statements into questions. Ask yourself, are you combining all of these together? Uh, taken separately, they can bring much relief and benefit. But when they are interwoven, the result is an unshakable foundation for life. I did not know that for a very, very long time. For 17 years, I fell in love with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I came into the rooms. I, I, I uh, had a little girl. I know pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. She was five years old. I had been uh, with the man 
for eight years. It wasn't like a one night stand. I didn't know who her dad was. I had been with him, but he was he was eight years older than I was. I left home at fifteen. My dad and I got in a huge. We just fought like cats and dogs. I always say you fight with the uh, parent that you're most like, right? So whatever parent is most like you is the one that you go head to head with. And my dad and I went head to head forever. And uh, he said one day, he said, if you can't live under, if you can't live under these rules, you can't live here. And I saw it as a ticket out. And I left at 15. I still finished high school. I am, I am a driven individual. I've been, I came out of the womb like, you know, little mighty mouse, you know? I mean, I think I came in, well, okay, let's get this in order. What are we doing here? And uh, I've had a tremendous amount of self-esteem. Ralph's the only one I ever heard say that you came into this world with a lot of self-esteem. I have a lot of self-esteem. I did not drink to get more self-esteem. But let me tell you, it is a devil-edged sword because I'm loud, I'm aggressive, I'm in your face, and I'm a woman. <laughs> presents itself as a little challenge sometimes. And, uh, but so I, I come with, you know, I can do it. I can, you need that. To, I get it done. I, I can do that. I can do that. And I don't even know what I'm doing, but I feel like I can do that. You know, I don't. I swear when Sandy Beach fell out in Midland, he literally was sitting next to me. And the next thing I know, he is out, he's white and he's in my arms. And I thought, oh my God, Sandy Beach just died on me. And, and we're in frickin' Midland, Texas, okay? This is not the place you want to have any surgery, okay? You want to go to Houston, Dallas, somewhere big. And sure enough, you know, they, I told him, I said, you guys, you need to call an ambulance. And this woman walks in, she goes, I'm a nurse. And I thought, okay, he's, he's all yours. And, you know, Sandy, should they get him conscious? What have you taken? Da, da, da. So we're sitting there and, and in walks the paramedics with no stretcher. And Sandy at the time was, was not getting around fast. And I thought, well, that's odd. And the guy goes over there, and he tries to sit him up, and Sandy goes back down. And I stepped in. I said, okay, that's enough. Go get a stretcher right now. Get him on that stretcher. We're taking him to the hospital. And the kid goes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then I try to get in the back of the ambulance, and the guy goes, oh, no, ma'am. Nobody's allowed in the back of the ambulance. So what you see on TV ain't really happening, okay? You can't get in the back of the ambulance. And I said, well, then I'll ride in the front. And he goes, okay. So I'm riding in the front. Oh, yeah. I'm between the two guys. They go, so so. how do you know this man? And I went, he's my husband. <laughs> not, a, not a worry in the world about that. And the, the one guy looks at me. They were young. He goes, really? <laughs> yeah. I, I like him about 45 years older than me. <laughs> and, oh, my God, it was priceless when we got in there because then Charlie seems to find us and though I hear him tell the woman that's my wife I'm like <laughs> and oh the guy is asking me questions like what's his full name it's like well we got married just pretty quick <laughs> oh my god but we we got him out of there and back speaking and I was telling one nurse, I said, ma'am, can you tell me what's going on? And she says, no, I'm not allowed to. And I kind of rubbed her on the shoulder and I said, I know you're not supposed to, but if there's any way you could let me know what the doctor's putting in the notes, I'd sure appreciate it. And you see her just typing around. She goes, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I, said, I know. Go ahead. Push that envelope, man. All my life, push that envelope. And I, you know, I misunderstood the tenth step. You can BS your way a lot in AA. Thank God. Thank God. You cannot know very much, and you can really help somebody. Don't underestimate the power you're carrying around. If you've remained sober, you have. You can do a lot with it. And sometimes God will put your ego to work, and you'll actually get in the work more, so that you don't hurt. You know, uh, take somebody else down. You know, we'll do a lot for other people more than we will for ourselves. Uh, I thought the 10th step was the evening review. The 10th step has taken on a whole new meaning. I thought it was the evening review. And if you're sitting in the room going, well, it is the evening review. I get it. I misunderstood it. And let's be very clear. I wasn't doing it anyway. So I'm sitting in a meeting <laughs> while they're talking about it. And I'm not doing it anyway, so I don't really care. You know what I mean? I don't really understand its purpose. And it seemed kind of silly. And I've been sober a long time. So that must be for the new guy. And... uh so come to find out, the 10th step is a spot check inventory taken throughout the day. It is not the evening review. Huh. Well, that's very interesting. Now, I always like to tell people, if this is new to you, and you go to a meeting on the 10th step, and somebody says it's evening review, you don't want to just raise your hand. Go, hey, 
No, you are wrong. No, that's the worst way to ever approach an alcoholic because we don't, we don't do that well at all, right? We do not take you telling me with that attitude. And let me tell you, as I get into this, you'll find out more and more of how that did not work for me. There's something I read that I just think it is profound. So bear with me. It's, it's about two paragraphs. Problems are a part of life. See, I thought when I got sober, everything was supposed to go great. And then I seem to see a lot of people, I walk through that door and life was wonderful. Well, I wouldn't have drank with you. If that's how easy it was for you, we're not going to get along, right? But I think life is wonderful, but it also is challenging. It's challenging a lot. That doesn't mean I'm miserable and unhappy, but problems are a part of life. They're inescapably woven into the fabric of our world. We tend to go into problem-solving mode all too readily. Action as if we have uh, the capability to fix everything. Does that sound like us? (laughs) Get out of the way. I can move that chair. Just let me move the chair. This is the habitual response, so automatic that it bypasses my conscious thinking. Not only does this habit frustrate us, it also distances me from God. Do not let fixing things be your top priority. We're ever so limited in our capacity to correct all that is wrong in this world around us. Don't weigh ourselves down with responsibilities that are not our own. Instead, make our own relationship with God our primary concern. That is not easy. All sounds great when you're reading this chicken soup for the soul in the morning. Oh, that's what I'm going to do. And then you get cut off in traffic and you're like... Then you get to work, and the the door is locked. Did the person not show up to, and then, right? Talk with God with whatever is on your mind. Seek his perspective on the situation. Rather than trying to fix everything that comes to our attention, ask God to show us what is truly important. Remember that we are en route to freedom, and let our problems fade into the light of the universe. This is not an easy task. This is why 10 and 11 I did not do them well at all. I thought 11 was about sitting and reading, actually, Chicken Soup for the Soul. I was reading that book, and I'd feel so good about it, right? And I just feel so much in the presence of God. And then I'd get ready. I'd put my hand on the door and let the games begin. You know what I mean? And I can feel almost levitated in the morning. But remember, this is talking about interwoven. What is the 10th step, right? What are we supposed to be doing? If you take the 10th step off the wall, it's a damage control step. So I always get like to get a bead on somebody when they're talking to me. You know, I ask them how long you've been sober because, once again, sobriety is pretty, it's like raising kids. If you got a 4-year-old, you know what a 4-year-old's going to do. You know what a 12-year-old's going to do. You know what a 16-year-old's going to do right? Now, some of them are a little bit better than others, but they're all, let's call it what it is, a pain in the ass, okay? I I love my children, but raising them was difficult, right? I mean, it was not like you woke up every morning going, oh, God, I love my children. So so what do you want? Okay, you don't want eggs, and you want pancakes, and you you know what? Why don't you all fix it yourself, okay? I mean, I was never that strong, nurturing mom, but kids, raising kids is challenging, same thing happens in sobriety because it's a, it's spiritual maturity, and and it comes with age too. So twenty year olds are, are are bulletproof. Thirty year olds, we start to look at what we want in life, where we want to go in life. Do we want to have another child? Are we going to have one at all? Maybe get a better job. Maybe get more money. Get a bigger house. Start doing things like that. Forty, you start kind of looking at it like, hey, honestly, if there's any decade I could stay in, I'd stay in my forties. So for you guys that are forty. Flip and enjoy it, okay? And uh, and then your 50s, you start looking back. You start having a couple of grandkids, you know? And then your 60s, you're looking and going, holy smokes, wow, there is a lot of things I look at differently. And then you add the quality of your sobriety to that. It's pretty remarkable. And I really believe between three and five years of sobriety, you're still working a program, excuse me, 18 months to three years, I think you're still working a program based on the abstinence of alcohol, and you don't know it, and you're not supposed to. It's just the way it is. You know, it's not good, bad, right, wrong. There was a kid at our meeting one time. He got up, and Marty, my sweet sponsor, I didn't know if Marty was going to be able to make it. She has Marty as her sponsor now. I was like, thank you. Uh, Marty and I were both sitting in untreated alcoholism, and she took me through the book. It was a remarkable experience. Uh, she's just smart as a whip, and her dad was a rocket scientist. 
and she knew it was a textbook, and she did almost kill me. She left me in the second step too long, but other than that, she she didn't. And and uh, today, you know, you, you fast forward 18 years, and it's flipping remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable what our lives have done. I can't, it's just, it's mind-blowing. And uh, this, she's in the meeting, and this kid gets up, and he's got getting his two-year chip, and he goes... I'm just so grateful that there was a man that understood the book, and he brought the book to me, and he did the book, and the book, and the book, and the book, and the book. And he had an answer to the solution, to the problem, to the book, and it just bugged the crap out of me. And I went over to Marty, and I said, did that kid bug the crap out of you? And she goes, oh, God. And I said, you know what's hard here is he thinks he's going to be able to miss it. He's not. He's going to hit a wall, and the trouble is, is when he hits that wall, he's already got all the answers. He just doesn't have the experience. And so, uh, as God has it, he was sent to me for a tenth step when his world was falling apart. And uh, I said, oh, boy, I've been waiting for this moment. I said, you know, when you got your two-year chip, I I worry more about the guys that are so on fire that they think they're going to miss it and be able to dodge all the bullets to the guy that doesn't have a clue. That's just my opinion. Uh, and so he has become an amazing member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's humble as can be. He's got six years now. But I got to tell him, be very careful with coming out with that, you know, I call it Bavoom. Do you all remember that cartoon? Wah, 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 wah. Just can't wait to shut somebody down in a meeting. And I was like that myself. Let me tell you, when the book says grow in understanding and effectiveness, uh, I'll never forget when Charlie and I woke up. It was between 17 and 20 years sober. We're starting to wake up, and we are finding out we weren't doing anything. We were going to meetings, and if I, I was taking the 10th step off the wall, continue to take personal inventory, and when we're wrong, promptly admit it, right? And that looks like damage control. So I'm going through life completely asleep. I step on your toes. You startle me awake. And I go, oh, my God, boy, I got Jimmy's really mad at me. So I go tell somebody, and they go, you need to go clean that up. And I go clean it up, and then I fall back asleep. See, what the 10th step is trying to get me to watch my thinking. And, I mean, I'm on fire, and I'm pissed. My sponsees aren't doing what I think they should be doing. And it's like, what the heck are they doing? I've told you three times what you need to do. And so I call Bob Darrell, and I said, Bob, my sponsees are pissing me off so bad. I'm I'm more angry than I've ever been. I wake up angry. And Bob in his in his way, this is I could see him going like this. I said, you know, Katie, why don't you say the prayer about growing understanding and effectiveness? And I don't know why that hit me. And I thought, you know what, Bob, I'll do that. And I kid you not, our conversation was two minutes. That was it, two minutes. And I sincerely said that prayer. Now, I've said other prayers sincerely, and God has also answered them. So it's not like you have to. But this particular one I did. And I woke up the next morning a different person. And not only did I wake up a different person, I my whole take changed. And I think it was because if God were here in skin and bone, he said, Katie, I'm going to bring a lot of people in your path. And you have got to be able to get a message through to them without that, right? And I'm telling you, I hear myself still. And God, Bob, that was a long time ago. You may not even remember it. And I still, somebody will call and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I just want to come through the phone and grab you by the throat. And then I go, well, you know, let's look, let's consider this another way. And I sincerely mean it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. It says on page 77, our real purpose is to fit ourselves. That means adapt ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. That's a tall order, folks. I mean, when you were walking through the lobby, did you pay attention to anybody? Did you look them in the eye? Did you say hello? These are really important things to do, you know, or were you, you just, you know, trying to get from point A to point B? This, this is so important, I can't even begin to tell you. It says we're here to play the, the role God has assigned. See, I'm going to get angry. I don't have the freedom to stay angry. And I'll tell you what, in this current environment, if you're watching the news, bad idea. Bad idea. Doesn't matter what side you're on, it's all a bad idea. And the other thing that's dicey is uh, social media. Oh, my God. 
I do none, so don't try to find me because I don't do it. I even retired out of my business because I saw it ahead of time that it was going to present itself as a problem. Anything that is so fabulous has a dark side too. That's just the nature of it. And so because of that, I told Charlie, we had an agreement, no social media. You know, I, I don't want you to be, you know, female stalking you, male stalking me. I'm not interested in having 80,000 friends. I'm just not interested in it. And one of the things that I think happens is we stepped across a line in that 10th tradition. And we started posting whatever made us, whatever view we saw. And I've argued with some people that believe that that was okay. I don't. I really don't. I don't believe that's okay because I've never seen what's going on currently before in my life, and I'm 65. I just got Medicare this month. <laughs> Is that unbelievable? Medicare. I had to go to a flipping seminar. So let me tell you real quick. You want A, B, D, and G, okay? Unless F is good, but I went with G. Um, so you don't ever want to get C, okay? I do know that. So just remember I said that. Um, in the book, it you know it, we're, it implies we're going to have trouble. Oh, Charlie, I have so abandoned everything. Last night he saw me as a nervous wreck. I went, I can't, I can't do this. I'm just going to be, I'm not going to be the teacher I like to be because that's not what God wants me to do today. Uh, and you know what I mean. Yes, I'm still teaching, so you don't have to come up and go. You really didn't remember. <laughs> I had a plan, and God abandoned the plan. Well, I didn't like it, but I'm doing it. So the book implies trouble, right? Page 25, blot out our intolerable situation the best we can, right? Uh, crushed, Bob uh, referred to the crushed by a self-imposed crisis. We can't postpone or evade. Either God's everything or he's nothing. The deliberate manufacture of misery. God didn't do it. But when trouble comes, cheerfully capitalize on it. Really? So when you're leaving out of here and you got to go catch a plane and you have a flat tire, cheerfully capitalize on that. <laughs> Gosh, God, I don't know what you have in store for me today. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not catching that flight home. You know, I mean, this is this is a tall order. And I like to say, you know, you, you got to realize they both suck. Lack of power is our dilemma. Both of these suck because when I need 300 bucks tomorrow, my first thought for many, many years was not to go to prayer. I'm going to figure out what I can pawn, who can I borrow it from, who can I call, who do I need. I go into self-reliance. You scare me, self-reliance. That's the nature of it. Until you begin with time, with maturity in, in your age, and with maturity in sobriety, you realize it all worked out no matter what when you took your hands off of it. And that only comes by putting your hands on it about 825,000 times, okay? So don't think that by year seven, it's going to be fine. Let me tell you something. You really want to talk about hitting walls? You're going to hit a wall between uh, 18 months and three years, three and five, five and seven, seven and 12, 12 and 15. And then somewhere around 15 to 20, I think it starts happening about every five years. And these walls are different. They're kind of like, well, you women will get this one, having a baby. Uh of course, in this day, maybe you men will have a baby too. God knows. I, I don't know. Uh, but you, you, when you're, when you have a baby, your first one takes forever because the area has just never d gone through that. But by the time you have your fourth, that thing is like Schlitterbunch, right? And so these walls that you hit, are, they seem to be forever, and then you get through it. And then they're just faster and faster, but they're intense. And you can't figure out what's going on because 10 and 11 get stale. They get very, very stale. And and I, I don't answer the seven questions in the evening review because it's too stale for me. Instead, I write something more about where am I resentful? Where am I selfish? Where am I afraid? And I most of the time scribble out a four-column inventory that never Marty never even gets to see because I see so much already in the inventory and I get freedom just right away because the minute I understand that I'm a hypocrite, oh, I'm completely free. I'm judging you for something I did exactly the same six years ago, maybe four weeks ago. It's unbelievable how this deal happens. So it says lack of power was our dilemma, but where and how are we to find that power? Well, that's exactly what this book's about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourselves, which will solve your problem. 
You see, the reason we're so lucky in Alcoholics Anonymous is because we are the, we are the number one program, right? We are the ones who set up the, the 12-step fellowships for everyone. We are the book that is written for us that other people might use. They might relate to it, but it's my book. It's about me. Okay, and these other 12 step fellowships, what I see happen in AA that worries me a little is like you got a sex problem. You got a money problem. You go to another 12 step fellowship. But see, you, the alcoholic is for you. You solves all your problems. And I asked one time Gary Kluckstall, who God made Charlie look like a little guy. Uh, He was a trustee. I mean, he would roll up on his knuckles like a gorilla. I thought that is a man, (laughs) that's a mountain man right there. My God. And uh, I said, I said, Gary, why why are there so many 12-step fellowships? And he goes, <laughs> and Gary just didn't mess around. He goes, so we keep them out of our meetings. That's why. <laughs> See, we don't, we don't want the guy with the sex problem to come into our meetings. If he's alcoholic, he's welcome. But if all he's got is a sex problem, he goes to another 12-step fellowship. So I see people try to manage their other problems when I think it's all untreated alcoholism. That's my opinion. I'm sticking with it. And if anybody takes me on, I'm not interested. So today is not the day to do that. Okay. (laughs) And so, uh, that means we've written a book, which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. Yeah. There's some level of moral compass we'd like for you to stand by. Uh, and it means of course, that we're going to talk about God. All we have is identification and power. Why in the world would we change that? If you come in and you got a problem with God, well, more than half our fellowship had a problem with God. But we ain't changing it. Suck it up, figure it out, move on. Right? I mean, it's really ridiculous. We're like, we need to be less God. Pardon me. What? It does, that does not make much sense. Ident- yeah, identification and power. That, why would, why would we change that? Because it makes you uncomfortable. You're going to be uncomfortable a lot in this world getting sober. Trust me. It's called restless, irritable, and discontented. Yeah. Part of our nature. Uh, Charlie did a beautiful job. I don't know how you pulled that off, honey boy. I was out there. <laughs> I feel it every word. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of our problems, right? And it's, I like it's self-centered fear, right? I'm scared to death I'm not going to get it. Then I get it and I'm scared to death I'm going to lose it. That self-centered fear never stops, if you ask me. You get better at it, but it never stops. The, the fact that I'm still some hope, some hopeful that Charlie's going to beat this thing. I am. I, 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 that's my nature. And, uh, the day that it may not happen, will be the day that I get surprised. And I don't want to live by myself again. I don't want to be widowed. I don't want any of that. But you know what? I know on some level that God will take care of me. And I've got a dog, which I can't believe I got a dog. I'm a cat person, but I got a dog. (laughs) And my kids are like, my daughter's 44. She's like, you got a dog, mother? I'm like, yes, I did. And it's a pain in the ass, and I love it, okay? (laughs) You can, a cat, you can leave. Somebody can come feed it. No big deal. Dog, oh, no, no. You got to take it to the Four Seasons, and it's got to have a bath. Do a little training. Do, can you do her nails, too? Okay, thank you. And Charlie goes, Jesus, Katie, we're spending a lot on that dog. I know it. And zip it. Zip it. <laughs> little mini Australian shepherd. Oh, my God. Yeah, I got the really chilled out dog. Yeah. <laughs> Not a Cavalier King Charles like Charlie wanted me to get. No, we were going to bring her on trips with us. And, oh, my God, we can't even have company over. Uh, <laughs> and I told Charlie, I said, you know what? We got a motor home. Bill got us, you know, sold us his motor home. And Joe and I, it was Joe and I's dream, and I always knew it was Charlie's dream. And and we, we got a motor home. It's like having a fort, man. I swear to God. These kids grow up today. They don't know what a fort is. A fort is the best. And you can tell who you want to come in it. Who has to stay out of it? You can do all kinds of things in a fort. And uh, Charlie and I get the, it's like a fort on wheels, man. And remember, I drove a school bus, so I can drive the damn thing. And I told Charlie, I said, hey, let me, we were on a pretty open road. Well, as a matter of fact, we were, were we heading to Tennessee, Florida, so, so on. And Charlie goes, you want to drive? I went, yes, I do. Now, my bus had the wheels in the front. I didn't drive what we called the no-nos, right? The wheels are in behind you. So with that axle behind you, it's a little, it's not hard to drive. It feels just like the bus, but turning is a little trickier. It's kind of like driving a big old pickup truck. And of course, I'm going in the turn too fast. Charlie's like, Katie, 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 Katie. I'm like, I'm fine. 
I'm fine. You know, and you hear all the clothes on the hanger in the back. Go, <laughs> oh. Okay, I got to slow that down a little bit. And then you catch the curb. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, okay. And Charlie goes, God dang it, Katie. I go, this is not the time to yell at me, okay? I am fine. I've got it. But I told him, I said, I tell you what, Charlie, I'm going to take a... I'm going to take that god dang motor home with that pup, and I'm going to go all over the place, and i got to just drive straight. I can't back it up, and I can't turn. <laughs> going straight. And I am going straight across the lower part of the United States. Screw that cold weather. I am not a cold weather person. So I am going that way. Uh, I always like to say it's important to see what's driving me, right? This driven, when you're driven, you're not choosing to act that way. That rapid dialing, that um, going by to see if the boyfriend's got a girlfriend there that you just broke up with, that need to try not to gossip about somebody but you can't stop yourself, that's driven. Be very clear on that. Going back to the same relationship that ten times is not insanity. It's driven. See, the insanity the book's talking about is behind the drink. The most insane thing we will ever do is pick up a drink. And if we asked you what are the t- top ten insane things you've done, you wouldn't put put a drink on there. You'd put, you know, chase my boyfriend in the, you know, church. You know, something that's going to bring a lot of attention because God knows that for some reason we're just fireworks coming off of us. And uh, But that driven is what you want to be watching for because when you're in it, you don't even know you're in it. And it happens so easily. And you're justified. So it's important to see what's driving me. Well, how do I do that? You find that in that inventory process because that's what the 10 steps about. Continue to take personal inventory. I'm a huge fan of saying this, and if it, if it makes you uncomfortable, that's not bad. Uh, you should be writing inventory. I think you should be writing inventory every couple of weeks, you know, at least in your evening review. And if it's still bothering you, take it to your sponsor. It's trying to, t- the 10th step evening, re- uh, the uh, 11th step evening review is trying to tell me I didn't do a 10th step. See, it's trying to wake you up to that. And, and I'm, I'm okay with you sending me a couple of those so I can get a beat on who you are. But after that, it's between you and God. It doesn't say that you're supposed to tell me. It's between you and God. And then if you can't get somewhere with that, then you bring it to me. But I think that that's really important because the 10 steps, four paragraphs, and the 11 step is two and a half pages. And they are profound what they're trying to teach us. So these old ideas, these values, that's what an old idea is. And remember, not all, all old ideas are bad. I'm a good mom. The only problem is I'm a better mother than you are. See? That's when it becomes a problem. See, I'm a good AA, but I I know I'm a better AA than you. You know what I mean? I mean, come on. There may be some truth in some of those people that I'm talking to, but that doesn't mean all the time. But I've got an ego that tells me it all the time. I always like to say the difference between God's still quiet voice and the ego is this is the ego. You don't have to do that. Whatever. And this is God's voice. No. Stop. Stay. Come over here. That's God's voice. And let me tell you, we could hear it drunk and sober. Just think about it. When you were drunk, you knew not to get in that car. When you were drunk, you knew not to go through those doors because there's trouble on the other side of those doors. You're driven. You can't stop it. He says, <clears throat> otherwise I go into self-reliance. No God, no inventory, no nothing. And I'm going to keep it to myself. I might go to a meeting and share it and think, oh, God, that felt so good. I left it there. <laughs> Whatever. You think you can just say it and leave it? Boy, I wish I could. You know, Marty's always so good. Marty knows me so well. And when Charlie was getting his liver resection, you know, when we found the first tumor, uh, Marty and I stay in very close contact. And Marty was a good friend. She was not a best friend, but she was a good friend. And I knew enough back when I asked her at 17 years to sponsor me. I said, Marty, our friendship is going to have to go by the wayside a bit. Because what happens for me, and it happens for her, and she knows that, is we lose perspective when I get too close to you as a friend. Because now I don't like, I don't really like the clothes you're wearing, I don't like the boy you're dating, I don't like the way you're talking in public, and you know, all of this stuff. And Marty's like, totally get it, Katie, I totally get it. And when Charlie was in the hospital, it was difficult. I mean, I, I was able to stay with him for 10 days, but he, he, unlike Joe, Joe was the kind of guy who would let me completely speak for him, take care of him, do everything for him. Charlie likes to do it himself. 
He's very much more of a man's man than what Joe was in that area. Joe did like to let me take care of him. And so when I told Charlie he's hooked up to all these machines, he's in ICU for four days, and he's and remember all the hospitals are understaffed badly understaffed right now and so they're not even supposed to let you stay in ICU but they're so understaffed they did and buzzers are going off there's you can hardly sleep in there it's miserable and he, he needed to go to the bathroom and and he wanted to go to the bathroom and I mean to tell you I told him at one point I said Charlie all you need to do is go Katie you don't even have to call me honey Katie you need to go to the bathroom I'm I'm on it I'm right there Instead, all you hear is this gorilla that's chained coming up out of the bed. And, I mean, everything's there. And he goes, and I'm like, so I'm over there on high alert the whole time. And then he can be kind of mean, okay? Let's call it what it is. When these boys get scared, they can get mean. And he gets so, and I thought, oh, I'll leave your ass right now, okay? Be yelling at me. So I'd go down, I'd run down the hall, I'd get in the bathroom, call Marty, half a ring. Honey, what's up? I go, he's just so mean. I can't believe it. I don't care. <laughs> oh my God. Thank God for Marty. She's like, honey, I know. I know. She always says that, honey, I know. She always just gives you that real gentle. And then she goes, now let's talk about this. And I'm like, okay. Obviously, she's coming at me. The inventory process, regardless if it's the fourth step, the tenth step, the evening review, and the eleventh step, it's a life or death matter. You get enough resentments, that door looks really good. You get enough resentments and, and the gifts of sobriety come to you, you end up leaving AA. I mean, the gifts of sobriety start to come to you really about after five years. <clears throat> Some of them get come earlier, but I'm talking average. And then by 10 years, you got two kids now, and you got a better job, and you're traveling a lot, and AA is just too much. And that person might make a conference or two from time to time, but the gifts of sobriety will always pull you away. That's just the nature of it. And let me tell you, it's tough. It's very, very tough. And not everybody falls under that category. I certainly did. But it's really tricky. It says no, uh, no business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, which this process requires. None of us. So, you know, when you don't want to call your sponsor, well, none of us do. But the gift comes when you do it. You know, it's people, I, I, I don't really want to write inventory on it. Well, rock on, man. Just stay out of my airspace because you, you, no, thank you. You know what I mean? I have never had a sponsee say, I don't want to write inventory on it. But what I tell them is, look, you need to write inventory on it. If you didn't get freedom and you only got relief from us talking, scribble out an inventory. It'll take you six or seven minutes. That's it. I'm talking, you know, Ralph said, you thought, just write it down real quick, real quick. Just write it down and then call me back because I got some time. And call me back in 45 minutes. And if you call me back in three days, eh, I might not get back with you right away. I told you 45 minutes. You said you had time and you didn't do it. See, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put my world on hold for that. Yeah, that's just I mean, I don't know if you're out there going, oh geez, I've been on both sides of that. But <clears throat> And the idea of watching for the resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear, and not waiting for it is huge. Don't underestimate that. That is profound. So what the 10th step's trying to get us to, after we've done damage control, because that's part of it, you'll do that for a long time, and then you move into watching your thinking, it's one of the hardest disciplines you'll ever do. I can hardly, you know, it, it took me forever. Mark was the one who said, Katie, he goes, you're, you, you've you been an athlete all your life. You know what it means when it says to stay in fit spiritual condition. He said, well, you know, I, I mean, I, I work out every day. Every day I work out. That's just the nature of it. I've been this person all my life. It, it, it does something for me. And so he said, well, you know what it's like. And I said, you know, the truth of the matter is, Mark, I don't want to do it every day. I mean, I pull up to the gym, and I look at the gym, and I'll sit and talk on the phone for 30 minutes before I walk in there. But I'm going in there. I'm not not going in there. It's the same discipline you have to take into 10 and 11. See, if you don't do it because you couldn't do it, then you won't do it. I mean, and, and keep in mind, guys, I'm not just talking about on awakening. On awakening is great and groovy, but if you didn't do an evening review, what are you taking into on awakening? Chicken soup for the soul, baby. You know, all you got to talk about my day before. 
My day before, I got a, a, a sponsee who's bugging the crap out of me. I'm scared to death for Charlie. Uh, I'm worried about his kids. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my life. I got all kinds of stuff going on. Marty's, Marty had left and gone out of the country for three weeks. Any concern for me? No. No. She decided to go to Europe. Uh-huh. Hope you're having fun over there. And uh, so now, you know, I got to call somebody out. You know, this is the way this whole deal works. But this is so important because the morning time on awakening does not have the gas it needs if you're just going to read some great spiritual literature. Don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful uh, practice. But you've got to bring yesterday into it. Our greatest enemies are resentment. Jealousy, ooh, 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 ooh. we know jealousy, you know, we, we act like it's a woman thing. Okay, well, let me see if I can make you jealous as a man. Believe mm-hmm. I can. It's a both thing. And jealous of money, prestige, all the kinds of things we can be jealous of. Envy, you know, sponsee's doing better than I'm doing. That's wrong. It's just wrong. I should be doing better than them. Frustration. Oh, my God, is this idiot going to keep talking? Jesus. <sighs> Same old, same old. And then fear. Fear is that, you know, that that bed. Fear is not the root of our trouble. Self-centered fear is. It's always thinking about me. I don't think too much of me, too little of me. I only think about me. It's in my DNA. How about this one? Indignant. Unfair treatment. is treated wrong. It's absolutely treated wrong. The desire to punish other people. That's kind of a fun one. <laughs> you know, somebody that you really don't care for, and then you see them hurt. Well, it doesn't feel as good as I thought it would, but give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> to get even are all the things that block me from God. And I think that they deserve it. And I'm not just talking physical abuse and sexual abuse. That's, that's horrific. Those are horrific. And those are tough. I have to send you to somebody else for those because I, that's not my experience. I can help you with everything else but those two. And those two, I want you to talk to somebody else that's got it, and an eating disorder. That's something. I, that, those are the three things on my list. I think that sometimes, too, it's a little tricky if you've got a sponsor that doesn't have kids and you have kids. That's a tricky spot because they don't know what that's like. As a parent, I would give my life for my children. That's the only person I will give my life for is my children. I love my husband. And when we were sitting there and they were talking about putting him on the liver transplant list, I remember thinking, oh, my God, COVID's over. I finally got my abs back. <laughs> now they're going to cut the wrong way on my abs and take half my liver out. I have to give it to Charlie. And this is while the liver transplant doctor's talking to us. <laughs> and I thought, okay, okay, God, boy, you got a lot of confidence in me, man. And all of a sudden he goes in, you have to be under 50. And I went, excuse me? Excuse, under 50? And Charlie goes, did you dodge a bullet, honey? I went, Woo! Ah! Why, yes, I did. <laughs> that was a scar I did not want on my abs. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, and as AA has it, my God, we had over 40 people, seriously, offer half their liver to Charlie. Yeah, we're not talking. Yeah, it was unbelievable, guys. It was unbelievable. And it, it wasn't just, hey, man, you can have half mine. It was I talked to my wife, my kids, and I sat down. Matter of fact, my kids are grown. They said, you've done so much for our family. They'll give you half theirs. It's been, it was unbelievable. It was such, such a, I won't throw that experience away. It's unfortunate we didn't get to live it, right? Uh, maybe we will. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Jeez, I don't know. As long as I run away from my problems, I'm going to continue to meet them in just in a new way. See, you, you will go, you will die with some problems. Problems are a part of life. They just are the nature of it. Here's the tricky part. I find myself repeating the old behavior, thinking that it's not the old behavior. Because, see, the, the ego is a shapeshifter. I come into AA, I'm very clear that what I do here, oh, gets me in a lot of trouble. Okay, well, that's like a dog, right? I'm not, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then all of a sudden a bird flies by. I go, oh, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for this. And the ego goes, <laughs> right? It's just fooled itself. That's why that third step when it says that we're almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though our motive is good, <laughs> that's the biggie. Right? We, we're walking around. We're do-gooders. You know, we're out on the hike and bike trail and there's a plastic bottle. We pick it up, kind of look at everybody. <laughs> that 
that's all right, I'll take care of it. <laughs> you low lives just walk past that bottle. You know what I mean? I mean, that's just the way we are. We don't we'll let you in traffic. We want you to go, thank you. <laughs> all, we got all kinds of ways that shows up. So you got to be careful. It's a shape shifter. That's why the continued inventory is crucial. My life is a demonstration of my inward condition. I thought we get the outside set up, figured out, kids right, right house, right schools, everything's good, right jobs, and it's an inward deal, and I'm unhappy. Bob had always said that there's wealthy men. He knew a wealthy man, bazillionaire, and uh, ended up committing suicide in sobriety. It's, 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 it's an option, guys. It is absolutely an option. We're, we're fooling ourselves. When Joe went out, I was shocked. I was shocked. I thought we had this down. Now, I knew that relapse was a possibility. I was shocked. And then you almost lost me. I almost drank at 17 years. I was 50 yards away, right right where that exit sign is. There was a Heineken bottle. I was at an outdoor concert. It was the first Austin City Limits outdoor concert. REM was playing. They'd asked me to come backstage. (coughs) Got my cowboy hat on, my crocheted halter top, my little short shorts. I mean, I am so hot. And uh, I walk by their their fenced-in area. The guy goes, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, I'm like, me? <laughs> I go over there. Yes. And he goes, we'd like you to come backstage. Blah, blah, blah. I go, you know what, guys? I can't do that, but very flattered. Thank you. <laughs> and then something happened and something snapped. And I saw that Heineken bottle. And I'm talking that mental blank spot was there. If you'd have told me that morning, were you going to pick up a drink? Absolutely not. I am in Alcoholics Anonymous for 17 years. No, thank you. I do five meetings a week. No, don't work a step. I sponsor six people. Yeah, didn't even protect me. And about halfway to that Heineken bottle, my phone rings. And it was a dead cellular area. You'd hear people walking around. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You know, dead. And I answer the phone. It was a buddy of mine. He had 22 years sober. And he goes, what are you doing? And I'm telling you, I told a little girl this yesterday. I might lie out there. I will lie out there in the world. I'll fake a heart attack. I'll steal a wheelchair. Okay, let's be very clear. That was yesterday. I will do that out there. But in here, I will tell you the truth. And I knew to tell the truth. I learned that day one that I came into AA. You tell the truth to another alcoholic. And I said, you know what, uh, Dan, I'm getting ready to drink a beer. And I mean, he, his head blew off. <laughs> and it startled me awake. And he goes, well, have you had it yet? I go, no. And he goes, get the F out of there right now. And I mean, he's, oh, you know, and you can yell at me like that. I can handle it. I mean, I'm just waiting for you to take a breath and I'm coming at you. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and so we, uh, uh, and I know I have never physically been hit. I, I, I don't know that you find that shocking. I find it shocking. I, I really do. Never once, not even a dodge it. You know what I mean? Never once. Uh, and, and one woman at one conference yelled out, yet. Yeah. I thought, girl, I'll take you out right now, okay? <laughs> find you and take you down. Uh, but, and so, I mean, I walked, and I walked about five and a half miles uh, out of there. I mean, I just walked and walked and walked and he talked and talked and talked and talked and I called Charlie and Charlie came and picked me up. I was in real trouble and I did not know how much trouble I was in and I'd love to tell you, I woke up the next day thinking, I got to throw myself back into AA. Not a chance. Not a chance. It took me almost 18 more months before I did anything. Before God once again sent another, he sends life boats every day. I just push him out of the way. Every day, every day, every day, every day. We don't even see them. It's very, very interesting. The, uh, the other cool thing about uh, what we go through, God is always using me to grow. To the day I'm off this planet, he will use me to grow. Don't think you've outgrown all your defects of character. Don't think you just only have a handful. That is delusional. You, you scare you bad enough, and you will behave poorly sometimes if you scare me bad enough. Charlie and I shoot shotguns competitively. Now, there's something that you've probably figured out about me. <clears throat> I am very competitive. I mean, off-the-chain competitive. I drive a very fast car. I like to be the first one at the light. I like to get past you as quickly as I can. I'm bobbing and weaving, right? And I, yeah, I mean, very, very fast car. And uh, and I got the dog in there with me. She's <laughs> Where are we going, Bob? <laughs> 
And so these are the kind of things that I like to do. I have probably got dyslexia. It was never around when I was in school. I was born in 1958. I probably am dyslexic. There's something clearly wrong. I have a learning disability of some kind, and I don't care. I'm not going to try to fix it. I'm going to work with it, right? I uh, have father-daughter issues because my dad and I fought like cats and dogs. I... Uh, I, everything I touch seems to turn to gold, and I've got good self-worth. Okay, so this is me going into the shooting community. Now I'm running with all these cowboys, and, and I've always been a tomboy all my life. And in this particular community, I'm thinking, you know what, I'm an athlete, I'm good at everything I do. I'm this sport, I am going to do so well. <laughs> so not the case. This is a mental sport. Well, I never did mental sports. So it's like golf. It's golf with a shotgun, right? And so the little clay pigeon comes out, and we do sporting clays. And Charlie's good at everything he touches, too. And so, and I'm deeply competitive with Charlie. I, I want to beat him all the time. And, uh, and he wants to beat me. Don't, don't fool yourself, okay? This goes two ways. And so we get in this sport, and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, God dang. You know, it starts with master classes, the highest, double A, A, B, C, and D. And you start in D and you work your way up. I have been in this sport for 12 years. I am only in A. And do you have any idea how difficult it is for me to go shoot with all my buddies and do terrible? I mean, I'm talking painful. I have turned around and my eyes are just water, you know, up. And these are cowboys. They're like, oh, ooh. <laughs> Nobody's going to go, ma'am, are you okay? Oh, they, they don't want none of that, right? My one buddy, he looks like Paul Bunyan. You know, he's gigantic, and he goes, I've never seen anything like it, Katie. These men just go, Whoa. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I told Charlie, I said, God has used every ounce of my shooting. I've had the best coaches you could have. I've got the best gun you can have. Charlie started buying me ammo by the container, for God's sakes, in from Italy. I go every day, me and my dog. I mean, I am disciplined like you wouldn't believe. I am going to succeed in this sport. No. <laughs> wow. And poor Marty, she's listened to so many calls to where I go, I don't even want to go to a, a tournament. It's too embarrassing. It's too humiliating. This is terrible. I'm busting my tail out here. For what? It's a fortune, and you don't win anything. It's me against me, right? <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm telling you, if you've never done a mental sport, you got no idea. So then I got my dyslexia. And the, the coach goes, and they're the best coach, for God's sakes, Katie, that trap is 15 yards away. Well, you've already lost me on 15 yards. Right, women? North, south, east, west? I got no idea. When I said I'm going straight, that might go to Pittsburgh, okay? I have no idea what north, south, east, west is, right? Now, if I look at the United States, I know, but I don't know where I'm standing. You know, so that's a, that's a 15, 15 yards away. I kept saying feet for about six years. Uh, 15 yards away, and it's going quartering, but then it turns into a crosser. So you have to hold your gun farther out for that. Blah, 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 blah. This is all I hear. So I thought, well, I'll take a bunch of notes. Well, the coaches are like, wow, I've never seen somebody take so many notes. I know, that's the answer. That's the answer. No, no, that's not the answer. Every bird has a different setup. And Charlie was trying to help me, but he would use the parental tone. Well, I left home because of a parental tone. Katie! I have a firearm in my hand, honey. <laughs> you don't want to do that to me. This is not good. My head blows off. Then, a, then another couple that, oh, my God, these guys that have girls and they're big, big, you know, hunters and whatever. They've made these girls be that. And I love it personally. These girls want to be that. And this little girl comes in and she's really pretty good. And we're about here. And she's like, the, and she just, just, I just am eating her dust. She is a remarkable shooter. She is a lovely woman. She's 18 now. She was 14, 13 at the time. And I love her dad. And uh, I'm jealous, deeply jealous. My husband, she wins this big state thing at 13 years old. He puts a big old banner up for her. Oh, is that just great? <laughs> I pull in. Of course, I, I you, Marty, Marty, you're not going to believe what I'm looking at right now. My husband's tacking up a banner for someone else. Not me. Nope, not me. 
And God has brought me to a place that I did not know was possible. Just about three weeks ago, I turned a corner. And uh, all these boys I'm shooting with are like, wow, Katie. And, you know, every man says, I can help you. Oh, every man can help me. And uh, I'll, be t- I'll be darned. It's, it was really amazing. Uh, one man was able to help me. And uh, I've turned a corner, and that's the beauty of what God does. I'm going to go about five more minutes. Y'all just hang in there. I uh, already told Lee. I do want to do a quick tenth step with Marty and I when Charlie was having his throat problems. <clears throat> I am a, I am who I am. I'm toned down. I know it's hard to see that. I really am toned down. I, I've done enough inventory with Lorenz that I take the high road. I, I don't pick fights. I don't do all that stuff. And it shocks me if I do. You know, it, it really does. It's, it's more of the time I'm taking the high road. Somebody else can deal with it. I don't want to. I'm not on the best of ground right now, so I am highly possible. I could lose my seat. But, uh, so Charlie is in the doctor's office, and, and um, he does the doctor way different than Joe did the doctor. And he, he just doesn't tell him the truth, you know. They, are you using much nose spray? He goes, nah. Well, he uses it about four times a day, Afrin, Afrin. I'm a holistic gal, Afrin, not good for you, right? And he says, <clears throat> are you clearing your throat much? And he, he goes, no. No, he clears it so much in the morning you can't even have a conversation with him. And that day, we had to go every three months for his throat. We thought he had throat cancer. And that particular day, I thought I was spiritually fit. And I guess I wasn't. And when he walked out, I just looked at him and I said, we have to drive to San Antonio. We we have a whole deal. We go to the outlet mall. We go to our favorite restaurant. We have breakfast, the whole nine yards. And I said, Charlie, you are a big, fat liar. Yep, that's right out of my mouth. And I mean, he came out of that chair like the Incredible Hulk. He goes, get it! <laughs> and I thought, you know, and I'm crying. And, and ladies, you know that cry that you don't want to be crying, and it's hysterical. And you can do <laughs> That one. Okay. I reach down. I grab myself. I go, I am out of here. I'm out of here. And I get ready to leave, and the doctor's coming in, and he loves us. And he goes, whoa, Katie, are you okay? No! And I just march out, and I'm sitting in the waiting area, and I know I've got to get in touch with Marty, but that was the time Marty had a big high-end job, and she's, you know, a court reporter in criminal court, and big deal, and I even asked the judge, is there any way she could put that on hold for just once? <laughs> judge Kuzarek's like, no. So I have to text her. She's quite the texter. I am not. So I'm out there. I'm hysterical. The doctor has just walked into Charlie's room. It says... Marty, I need a new toolkit for a sick husband. We're at the doctor's office, and I just left the room. I can't stop crying. I must sit there and be submissive. I can't do that. He does not give them enough information. Now, if you've listened to a lot of inventory, you just heard my old idea. I can't be submissive. I'm scared to death he's going to force me into being a submissive woman. Do you ever see anybody ever going to make me be that? (laughs) When I'm scared, I think so. Not going to happen. But at that time, I think so. He doesn't give them enough information. Marty immediately texts me back because she knows we're going to the doctor. I've told her. I keep her in the loop of my life. So if I call you, this is not let it go to voicemail, and you look at it four hours later. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. It must be so painful. You know, she gives you that little pet, and then she just knocks your head right off, man. (laughs) I'm sure he's scared, maybe even terrified. None of that's about you. How can you be helpful? Are you in the doctor's office treating him like he knows nothing? (laughs) That, That you're the doctor police? How are you coming off when you're trying to give information to the doctors? Are you smugly superior? Well, I instantly stopped crying, which actually scared me, because I thought, am I crazy? Oh, my God. (laughs) Hysterical to stop. And all I could text back was, yes. (laughs) Marty wasn't done. Stepping on his toes, are you? Well, if not you, who? Cloaked in a good motive. You have all the tools, hon. Just use them. I know hospitals and doctors are some traumatic stuff for you, and you go on super high alert. This is a new day. And I shot her a text back and said, thanks. And the best part of this is Charlie walked out. He wasn't done with his appointment. This happened in five minutes. Because I know it says immediately 
talk to somebody. Immediately talk to somebody. There's four very strong directions, right? And he walks out and he says, honey, please come back in here. And I looked at him and I got up. Otherwise, I couldn't have. My feet would have been in concrete. It just doesn't work that way. At least for me, it does not work that way. That 10th step says we're to talk to somebody at once, right? Make amends quickly if we've harmed anybody. Uh, I, I normally can rattle that thing off, and right now I'm just drawing a blank on it. Ralph, help me out. The four things we're supposed to do in the 10th step. Uh, ask God. It's the last one, right? Uh, Someone? Yep. Well, we're supposed to do everything but yell at him. Okay, so... <laughs> There you have it. Okay, I promised you guys I was going to wrap this up, but I don't want to wrap it up without <clears throat> quoting something that Bill Wilson said. The 11th step in the evening review tells you to look at your 10th step and write it out. I th it doesn't say you have to write it out. I th I'm a big fan of writing it out. And uh, I love writing love letters to God. I love doing all that God expects me to do. We have an amazing, amazing relationship. I hear the undeniable voice of God all the time. Emmett Fox is my teacher, has always been. He says, my friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator. Ask yourself, is that, is that what you're doing? Is that where you are? If you want to be there, it's available. See, he turned statements into questions, that I would have the elements of a way of living which would answer all my problems, belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things, were the essential requirements, no suggestions, requirements. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us. While I laid in the hospital, and the thought came to me that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have had what had been so freely given to me. Perhaps I could help some of them. Then in turn, they may work with others. I hope that still gives you goosebumps when you hear it. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you, Bill Wilson. It's been a real honor and a privilege to have me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.